bioengineering for the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, I don't do it myself because I'm in this role of CEO, but I used to actually manufacture biologic drugs on the manufacturing floor. And I used to also work with the uh, bioengineering team um, to create or recreate or improve those manufacturing processes. Um, so that's that's the bioengineer I am. I'm not a... Um, um what's the other one a, a biomedical engineer is a, is a is different you know that's more for uh dealing with doctors and whatever innovative ways you may come up with a different surgery or a different procedure um maybe uh playing with something in the lab last minute um so that you know to give you an example of that that's kind of how um uh these uh immunosuppressant drugs and cell therapies came about um, it was life scientists and R&D and stuff dealing with that stuff. But the the, the people that kind of did it first was the biomedical engineers on site at the hospital um, as far as a patient coming in and having an autoimmune disease and you having to figure that out. Um, and so autoimmune diseases for a number of years, I'll probably say I, my, my cousin, I won't say his name, but I have two cousins uh, with autoimmune disease called bubble boy disease where the, you know, the immune system attacks itself and they're very sensitive when the oldest one was younger and he first got diagnosed, you had to do straight bone marrow transplants and we had to stock up the bone marrow and all that stuff at the hospital. And they would do those treatments on site. Fast forward, this younger one is about, ooh, I think it's about 10 years difference between maybe uh, more than that between his little brother, um, who's a twin. He's a, 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 what you call it, a fraternal twin with his sister and he has it. Um, and so fast forward today where you have these treatments that you don't have to do the bone marrow transplants now. Now you got the drugs such as the um, the viral and gene vectors and cell therapies that you can just do with a with a syringe um, on the spot at home on a regimen. So um, I say that to say that, you know, it's different types of, of bioengineering. Biomedical has definitely been just as instrumental as the traditional bioengineering for biopharmaceutical drugs, as well as bioengineering for agriculture, as well as bioengineering. Uh, for the biofuels industry, but um, I'm in the biopharmaceuticals, and so generating, creating those processes, improving those processes, and actually manufacturing the drug itself is where I fit in. Oh, you know what? Y'all gonna be mad because I ain't necessarily choose it. I fell into it, <laughs> <laughs> and I liked it later. Uh, I actually was um, at the time where I kind of fell into it. I was working at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research doing bench top research um, at the Naval Base in Silver Spring, not the hospital. And at that time, I was in the molecular, um, I think I was in the molecular pathology um, department, and we were investigating, you know, um, I'm about to say COVID, not COVID. Um, uh, what's the one with the uh, mm, mm, mm. dengue virus, um, West Nile virus. Thank you. That's what I can think of. Um, and then around that time, that's when um, uh, the study of omega-3s and omega-6s and how they affected breast cancer, those are the things that I was looking at at the time. And so our PI, who I won't name, who still works for the federal government, got caught with our hand uh, in the cookie jar, misappropriating funds. Federal government sent down, I mean, they sent down Army lieutenants and sergeants and higher ups down to the base, um, Navy, Navy, and same for the Navy and Marines. I think we had one of each come and sit with us and investigate us. And ironically, at the time, you know, the team was mostly black and brown. Uh, most of us was from a uh, local university between Howard, University of Maryland, University of Baltimore, all that stuff. And we didn't know. We think we just being interviewed what we do every day. And so we're telling them, hey, we do this and that every day. This is the time we do this. We just talking. We don't know because we're not in the service. We're all civilians. Um, and so I kind of found out I was doing an investigation of her misappropriating funds. And so she started firing everybody. So me being the smart person I am, I was like, well, shit, I'm just going to wait till she fired me, but I'm going to go get another job. And then I could just work two jobs, or, you know, ball out. I was partying six days in a week. Got a reputation, you know, party schedule to keep up with in D.C. Uh, so I end up getting a job through a temp agency at Human Genome Sciences in Rockville, which is now GSK. And I had two jobs for about three months. And she was like, you know, finally, she's like, oh, well, it looks like you've already secured another place in employment. You know, go focus on that, whatever. But I had already, you know, caked up within that three months. Um, and so that's how I kind of fell into it. And so when I first got to Human Genome and doing it, I didn't like it because, uh, you know, working at Walter Reed, bench top, I got my white coat. I got my name on my coat. I make my own schedule as long as I, you know, meet the meet my deadlines for my reports and my experiments and be on time with things. It didn't matter what time I came to work. It didn't matter what time I left. Right. It's all based on on my, uh, you know, progress and my, and my productivity. 
So it was an adjustment to work in a team like environment and to start at the bottom, right? Because even though big pharma and biopharma is life sciences, it's very corporate, right? So, you know, life sciences, your version of starting in the mail room, uh, the version of, of corporate starting in the mail room and corporate, but life sciences is starting at the bottom. And at that time, it's being a gopher. You know, you had stainless steel equipment, you had uh, unilateral uh, facilities where you can only go in one way, come out one way. One side is this, one side is that. So once you gown out of one area, you have to walk all the way around and regown in. To, so I was highly uh, irritated and was pretty vocal about it. And then um, I ended up getting a, a mentor, Sandra Brown, who still works at, at uh, GSK Rockville today. And she kind of pulled me inside and helped me um, better understand things as far as the manufacturing facility, but more importantly, gave me some, trained me to give me more autonomy, to get me more engaged. Um, because at the time I was like, hey, I'm not doing this. Uh, it's, if it was four o'clock, four 30, I'm leaving on the dot. People know, you know, that work in biopharma or life science, especially in manufacturing, know that you're at the, at the, um, the, the beg of the, the process, right? So if that step ain't done, we, we got to wait to do that step later today. You had to stay late and do it. Um, oftentimes they'll put us up in hotels doing rental stores to stay at a hotel. We had a hotel, like it was kind of across the street from human genome at that time or down the street. I can't remember. And so often they would put us up in hotels. So people didn't, you know, outside your families and stuff didn't understand that. So people thought I was lying. They were like, oh, you spend nights in my house. You, you doing all this. Shit. I'm like, nah, like hit a receipt. They're like, that's a hotel receipt. Don't no job put you in no hotel for like no week or whatever. Cause sometimes there'll be a snowstorm. We had to stay there mm. the whole week. But anyway, um, um, I, I, I definitely fell into it. And once I got more responsibility, uh, definitely, definitely, um, I can't thank Sandra Brown enough for what she did for me, um, uh, to get me engaged. And, and that just sparked curiosity from there. I started learning things outside, um, and really leaning into it. Um, especially when I got diagnosed with a chronic condition before I had to finally go to, you know, take time off. Um, I kind of finally just like leaned into it, got more, more responsibility and just kind of fell in love with it. And it wasn't just about, um, the bioengineering or the manufacturing piece of it. I think for me, I fell in love with it because of the the extended benefits of it and then the extended challenges of it, right? So I'm at a point where I'm just making these drugs. Uh, one of the drugs I was making at the time was uh, still in clinical trials, but it was for anthrax. And we had the anthrax deal at that time. And so we were stockpiling uh, for the federal government. And so we was doing that. And then I was also part of a team who was manufacturing a drug for lupus. So that's how I kind of got my CDMO feel because at that time, uh, and I think they still do, they had a, uh, I worked at the small scale pilot plant in human genome. And so that's where we tested out different manufacturing processes for, excuse me, different drugs. And pretty much everything in that plant uh, was either at the preclinical stage or the clinical stage. So we were doing different drugs, different, um, different points of, of the year. And so the lupus drug is what really got me because I had went to a some type of seminar, or whatever, sit down thing at the company at the time. And they were talking about the human clinical trials. And they mentioned that they'd recruited, I mean, they did not recruit any African American women. They only recruited women from India. And so I raised my hand. I said, Well, you know, I ain't no expert, but uh <laughs> lupus has a high rate of occurrence. Right. And uh, African-American women. So, you know, why don't y'all include, you know, African-American women in the study? And they said, well, it's simple. It's just easier to get women from India. And so when I, you know, started to take a deeper dive again on my own, because I'm a nerd. Um, and I was like, oh, no, this is a this is a financial thing and a regulatory thing. You know, you can go to India, get away with certain things, make the data look good, and you'll get the FDA approval because you want to be in an American market. You also know the history of working with African-Americans, knowing that you're probably not going to do them the right way, right? And or knowing that most likely this drug is not going to treat them because it wasn't discovered for them or by them, right? And so when I learned that, I said, oh, I, I got I to gotta fix this. Shit. And the other thing I noticed was the impact, um, not just in human genome, but later in my career, especially when I got to Amgen in Thousand Oaks, California, working at the headquarters. And I worked at a pilot plant there at the time. But I start paying attention to the neighborhoods and the people that work there and how all the white people had a house, three kids and a dog and two cars and college is paid for. Uh, and I said, well, if they can do this for their communities. And, you know, the, what, what is the suburb before it becomes a suburb? It's a cornfield right. or it's the hood. 
right? It's never a suburb starting off. It's either rural or super urban and they cleaned it up. And so at that time, uh, the Thousand Oaks was more rural. A lot of cows and shit out there and they had, you know, all these companies start moving in. So the biggest employers of Thousand Oaks at that time when I worked there was 3M, the people that make the tape, uh, Amgen and uh, Baxter and, um, ooh, what's that sauce? Um, let me get it. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna laugh at this. Damn, I ain't even fat no more. What is that red? Uh it's a red chili sauce, uh, a red chili sauce with the green top. Not the sriracha, right? Yes, the sriracha uh, plant yeah. is in Thousand Oak, and then you had the farms. So coming down the highway, one side you smelling sriracha, the other side you might be smelling cow sh strawberries and oranges is what you what you I mean, uh not oranges, uh what else is out there? Maybe uh it's not oranges. You had strawberries and something else. I forget, but mainly strawberries, what you can smell going down. Uh, I think it was a highway, uh, I think it's five, highway five. That must have been an insane smell, just for the record. Oh, it's that mixture, but it was beautiful to see everybody working and being productive and right. poverty being really, you rarely saw a homeless person out there. You rarely saw, even at the sleazy motels, <laughs> In Thousand Oaks, you rarely saw somebody standing outside and, and conducting that type of business, if you understand what I'm saying. So Absolutely. for me, I was like, you know, I want to I want to do something similar. So I started making my plan um, for the company on paper back in 2014 or 2013, really, and figuring out where do I need to go to be ready uh, to execute my company at the time? What education do I need and what other experience um, do I need? And so that's when I start. Uh, making sure I put myself in position to get on the manager or management track. It was mentorship a little bit, but not so much. And the reason why I say not so much, because obviously I'm doing something that nobody's done. I'm the, I'm the first African-American woman to do it, second African-American person to do it, you know, six to eight leader, le years after uh, Dr. Percy LeVon Julian um, in, uh, in Chicago and in, in Oak Park. Um, but, uh, for me, I think, you know, once, once I went to that lupus, uh, uh, event, figured that out. And then my mind was rolling, like, what, like, how can I do this? And so at that time, uh, the, probably about a year later from that point of that lupus event that I went to, I was still working there. Um, that's when they just came out with single use equipment. Uh, it was Accelerex. Accelerex was the first person. Accelerex got acquired by GE. Now today it's, it's a, a Cytiva. Uh, but at that time, Accelerate just, just came on the market. And I'm going to have to find this shit, But the slogan was, you can literally uh, set up your factory at a strip mall. That's what they said. So when I'm looking at this equipment, and, and at that time, they were still, uh, you know, had the um, the plastic shields around the plastic or the single-use equipment. You stuck your gloves in. They still have, they still sell it that way if you want it yeah. that way. Um, but at that time, that's what they were selling to say that you can literally do this in the parking lot. Um, if you didn't have, you know, I mean, a strip mall, if you didn't have a, the greatest HVAC system, that box over the bi-rector with the gloves was the solution to protect the product and protect you. Um, so I, I ran with that sh I went to <laughs> my manager, not really understanding the hierarchy of corporate at that time. Right. And uh, we had the same last name. So I used to tell him, like, yo, aunt, like, aunt, right? His last name was Williams, Anthony Williams. I was like, he'd be like looking at me crazy because I'm knocking his door. But like, yo, check this out. Like, did you see this? I was like, yo, you need to rip everything out, get rid of this. <laughs> Not understanding regulatory all the way at that time, uh, you know, as far as the facility built out and things of that nature. And so he looked at me and was like, you need to go back to work. And I didn't. I went back to my desk. I had all this shit sprawled out of binders and articles and things on my desk and my cubicle. So I probably took over somebody else's cubicle with all my shit. Uh, really trying to figure this out and then I called Accelerate myself I mean I had them revved up like I had some big investment coming in and like I was really going to like set this thing up and then that's when I got diagnosed and, and, and got uh, sick so I was had to stop um, but from that point on and then fast forward to looking at the neighborhoods um, in Thousand Oaks where I worked in and, and what that looked like and I was like you know what I can do this. I just got to put these pieces together. And the, and the crazy thing is, you know, what most people don't know, especially this generation, no disrespect to this generation, but because everything's so accessible um, to this generation, nice. um, and I had it too, I guess one of my gen, um, what am I? I'm a millennial. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm a millennial. I'm 38. 30, I'll be 39 next week on the okay. 21st. But uh, by, by uh, what is it? I think it's Gen Z now. Yeah. Gen Z had everything at their fingertips. So 
because they were so used to looking up things uh, for what they want, right? If it's the new shoes, sneakers, the latest song, uh, the gossip on TMZ, they look it up. But when it comes to looking up things that can help them make money, I don't think they necessarily made that connection yet outside of being an influencer. Because an influencer can do things themselves, right? You can make your own content, you have all these tools. When it comes to entrepreneurship and doing something on the scale that I'm doing, it takes a team. It takes a mind that tends to think strategically and collaboratively, meaning not just who I'm going to do this with, but what's going to be the benefit for us to do this together. What is the exchange? And so those things, they're not going to teach you in school. Hell, they don't even teach you that in the MBA program. I don't have an MBA, but I got a master's in business from, from Full Sail or MS. And even in that program, they don't necessarily teach you uh, precisely. They talk about it, but they don't lean into it and say, this is probably the most critical things that you can learn and understand in order to be successful to uh, start a venture capital back company. That is the difference. Small business. You can raise me your booster ads. You can take your 401k, go run out of buildings, set up, make burgers or whatever widget that you make from that standpoint. Go get a co-packer or whatever it is. You know, some of these, these terms that you probably see on Shark Tank, which I do recommend. I watch a lot. I've been watching Shark Tank since day one. So I learned a lot about pitching from that um, in different terms. But um, those are the things that I think people, the, the generation today that's graduated from college or entering college, in order to do something different, in order to be successful on a magnitude where you're a million dollar to a billion or trillion dollar business, mm -hmm. you have to go get that information yourself. You have to be willing to humble yourself and sit during your free time and Google and read because everything is not on Google. Some mm -hmm. of the best books, huh? I'll show you right now. Son, I know this guy is not a popular guy right now, but some of the, can you see that, Peter uh -huh. Thiel? Let me turn. I, mean, I see. Thing. Yep, Peter Thale there down at the bottom. Yeah, there you go. Yes, you, you can see that, right? Yeah. Like these are the things. This is my second second time reading this book. Awesome. Um, but these are the things that you got to do. Then you also got to read books like this. You know what I'm saying? To Ray with balance mm -hmm. to understand and get your your personal uh, ment uh mental health uh correct right so this is his yeah. third book i read every book this man puts out he's still my pastor today from when i was in when la and then you also got to know you know background to give you that fight right yes. you know what I'm saying? You got to read that right uh this yes. is a new one they, i think they published it right when he passed but this john lewis joint carry yes. on you know what i mean you also gotta stick to your roots you know what i mean because everything <laughs> i got that one <laughs> I haven't read this one yet. It's still sitting here. I got to get to it. But um, unconventional reads like this really give you drive. I don't care if you're black, white, or whatever. When you read people that have unconventional sets like Gucci Mane and Migos, shout out to Take All, Rest in Peace, Quality Control. Um, yeah. And I don't get on top, but look at that story. Look how with Motown, a guy similar to me, came from manufacturing cars and applied that business model to music to full circle the next generation of Motown, which is quality control. And now these guys are in partnership. Look at that. You're not going to get that from school. One of them, whether it was Coach K or, or the other one, I, I apologize, I don't remember his name. One of them had to have that thought process to get them the idea that making that deal with Motown was essential. And shout out to Ethiopia. Um, I used to work with Tina, Tina Davis when I was in the working at Moonlight in the music industry. So that's how I made Ethiopia. But don't look how that came full circle, how you can use unconventional and conventional wisdom to do something great and to fill in the gap and fulfill a need, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's done that, right? Even the way Master P did it, the way, uh, uh, what was that? Uh, I forgot, Something House Records down in Houston. I was raised in Houston. And then you had Def Jam with Russell Simmons. Right. Um, all those cats did something unconventional and quality control took all those situations and then created their own and then ran it back full circle to the originator with Motown, right? right? Same with, you know, with what Tyler Perry's doing. Like, I don't know if y'all seen the, the latest movie he got on Netflix, which is very different from his other works, but I've been, I knew he had that in him. I've been waiting on that. I've been telling everybody, like, people hate on, on on Tyler Perry, but he did the same thing I did. He he went through the play route. He figured out how to draw a crowd. He figured out what his niche market wanted to see all the time. And then when he took his business from the next level, from the Chitlin Circle of Pays to the film industry and, got, and did his deal with, uh, what is it, uh, Lionsgate. Yeah. Um, he also looked at what 
uh, Spike Lee did, right? He looked at all these other black directors, uh, Robert Townsend, all them guys. He looked at all what they did and say, okay, well, I started differently for them. No, I did not go to film school or art school, but I know how to hire experts. Um, no, I don't know anything about marketing and distribution, but I can research and get lawyers, right? And then when it was time to make it to the next level, he did Lionsgate, and that's why he still has to deal with Lionsgate today. That's why he's been the only one to maintain that distribution deal because he did his homework, guys. You guys got to be hungry. You got to do the work outside. You got to learn, you know, from the past of what they did in full circle, right? I just talked about uh, General Motors and Motown, right? Um, so you, it's, 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 I'll tell you this, to put in the plainest, plainest words. And so you can get to your next questions. I know I'm long-winded. But in order to be successful, you have to choose what success you want and what that looks like and what are the different pathways to get it. And last but not least, to sum all that up, what is your appetite for risk? Mm -hmm. Success all goes down to what's your appetite of risk. And that determines the level of success you want and what kind and what you want it to look like. If I want to leave my work at work and have my vacations with my family, pay for college, have a nice house and just retire and be able to take care of my immediate situation, maybe do some volunteer work, go be an employee. Right. Hell, go punch a clock is what you need to do. And there is nothing wrong with that. I commend that. Trust me. I think about it like, <laughs> maybe I should just go punch a clock. It'd be a lot easier than dealing with this. Right. The next one to that, that's a little bit higher than that is, okay, well, go be a salary employee. Right. Mm -hmm. But what comes with that is what? Responsibility. So versus a, a hourly employee, a salary employee may not be able to take the vacations all the time when they want to take it. They may have to more than likely always bring some type of work home to finish it and not get paid for it. Um, you will have to deal with people reporting to you, whether it's directly or indirectly, and be collaborative to get your work done. But nevertheless, you still have this built-in thing where you know where your paycheck's coming from, right? You know exactly what it's going to be. You know exactly what your tax is going to be. You know exactly what your bills are. And you kind of know some way. We ain't going to get into to equity. But um, for, for most people, you know what steps it take to escalate to get up to director and C-suite role, right, once you get to that point. That's one way. Then you have one where you say, well, I just want to make my own hours and leave work at work, maybe take some home and, you know, do something a little bit different, but have my own control. That's small business. You take your own money, you invest it, you come up with something, whether you do something on your own in retail or food service or whatever the case, cosmetics with barbershops, whatever, nails, whatever, or you do a franchise and you invest your money and get into a Chick-fil-A and McDonald's or whatever, and you expand from there. And that is a great infrastructure if you want to do it that way because you can start literally what you have and do it right but if you want to be over here where i'm at with venture capital and a billion dollar industry with the potential for billions and millions of dollars and trillions of dollars of revenue and make an impact a real dent not just in your immediate family neighborhood situation but in more of a global domestic situation then you're going to have to put in that time. That is not teachable. What college and what's your employment experience, because that's important too. You can't, you know, I know we got, you know, you see, excuse my language, some of these white folks jump from college to VC back, right? You want me to give you some examples? Theranos. <laughs> you got Theranos. I think, uh, who we just had recently? Somebody else just came out with something bogus. I can't think of the company. Um, but anyway, you you got that part, right? You got non-profitable companies like Uber, right. non-profitable. Tesla, non-profitable. Twitter, non-profitable. SpaceX, getting millions of dollars of billions of investment, non-profitable. Uh, what's the co-worker space guy? I forgot his name. His oh, yeah, the WeWork guy. Um, WeWork, yeah. non-profitable, right? That's what they do. But folks that look like you and me, they're going to ask you when you become profitable, how much they're going to quiz you like you a neuroscientist in your business. And so therefore you got to do the extra work to be able to track those dollars, hit those milestones and have a real impact on our community. And guess what? It ain't new to us. We did it already. You know, when we did it, we did it during slavery. If it wasn't for us being smart enough to come up with things like the cotton gin and all these other different areas to help ourselves to make our lives somewhat easier that was within our control, 
we wouldn't have America what it is today. If we didn't build Black Wall Street, if we didn't do all these extra things, uh, like I'm just now learning about, I just partnered um, for a workforce development program with this organization called uh, Philadelphia OIC. And it was founded by a civil rights leader back in the, hmm, I say he's back in the 1940s, 1950s as well. So he was right along there, uh, 50s and 60s with Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. His name, his name was uh, Dr. Leon Sullivan. And he started a workforce development organization that not just spread domestically where he put his first one at in Philadelphia, it spread global. In fact, his set of principles were what was used to formulate the uh, agreement and documentation to get Nelson Mandela and, and apartheid to end. No, I've never heard of Dr. Sullivan until you recently know. when my mentor now, uh, uh, Sheila Ireland, took over as president and CEO a few months ago. So mm -hmm. these are things that, guys, we've already done re research and it's obviously had an impact. Oh, full circle again. Dr. Sullivan was the first African-American to be on the board of General Motors. You see how I keep making these connections, right? And each one of those cats did something very unique, but they had to take their own reins. They took their foundation of knowledge, whether it was traditional college or, or uh, and, and a lot of them had a, a lot of influence from the pulpit, right? Malcolm X, uh, uh, Martin Luther King and Sullivan all had a, a large foundation of support from the pulpit that did what? And they did it differently and it impacted business. Dr. Sullivan personally took it personal when they would not hire his people in the Philadelphia in North Philadelphia to work at factories like Tasty Cake. Y'all eat Tasty Cake, right? Y'all eat them damn donuts. He told them for about 90 days straight, every Sunday, do not buy Tasty Cake. Within 90 days, they sales plummeted. Guess what happened? Dr. Sullivan, we're going we gonna to go ahead and hire your folks. We got this. Oh, now, now, now you need us, right? That's what's going to happen if, 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 I'm not saying everybody has to be a venture back um, company, but if that's what you want to do, then you have signed up to be a leader. You have signed up to do the extra work for the long nights, long days of traveling. You have signed up to be humble enough to be broke and have a change of lifestyle than what you used to have. If you was like me that was making seven, I mean, six figures and living in LA and, and doing what I did best at that time. But I knew if I stayed, if I did not make a strategic move to get back to the East Coast and get back to work from my perspective, um, then I wouldn't have what, what I'm doing today. And more importantly, outside of myself, I wouldn't be able to impact my community on where I'm trying to take our black and brown community to the next level. What, what drives me every morning is knowing that I have an opportunity to change the way that my people are accustomed to living right and it's a force a custom right we didn't ask to be brought up be brought over here we didn't ask to be slaves we didn't ask to, to live in these different areas that we call ghettos or hoods or whatever and it's funny right because if if you're jewish and you say you're from a ghetto it's understandable right understandable even though they came over here by choice we say we're from the ghetto it's looked at like we lazy we ain't got no drive to do shit. In reality, the only times you put in the ghetto because it's something that's forced. You're segregated, you're outcasted, you're told that you're different, you're told that you don't fit, right? So that's what drives me every day is, is being a part of a culture which entertainment is starting to do. Uh, not that they haven't, but you're really starting to do it well. You're starting to see a lot more African-American shows that accurately depicts the African community um, at all levels of income, um, from all rise to uh, reasonable doubt uh, to hell, uh, Take your pick. There's it's a ton of them out there, right? Um, and so that's what drives me every day. Another thing that drives me every day is just knowing that um, I want to retire my parents, right? I got the support of my family right now, a lot of support of my family right now. And so I want to retire them and reward them for sticking with me um, to ride this thing out. And then the second question you said, what about bioengineering? Yeah, um, what, what specifically decided, about bioengineering? I would say being able to because uh so so the name of the company is, is lucas pop bio contract drug manufacturing work in partnership with jefferson uh, university right now um we're able to uh perform or, or execute preclinical services so we can develop a manufacturing process including the cell line development actual formulation recipe um, and we can produce or manufacture material for animal studies the future facility that we're building in Southwest Philadelphia, which is will be a CGMP 80,000 square feet facility. And that's where we'll be able to uh, start manufacturing for human clinical trials in the commercial market once those respective products are approved by a regulatory agency. So 
what drives me with that as a CDMO um, is that I get the opportunity to work with our target market, which are startups. I get the opportunity to work with a large amount of minority owned startups. So these are startups um, that are black and brown, whether they're uh, Spanish descent, African descent, or Indian descent, um, or West Indian descent. Um, but uh, a lot of these companies don't have an opportunity to get the products off the ground. A lot of these companies just simply license uh, their product and they lose out on money. So they can't necessarily always sustain their pipeline or other discoverable druggable assets they may have in a pipeline. Um, or it may be something to the effect where because uh, they can't get the product licensed because it doesn't have a favorable population to big pharma, meaning it's not enough money to them. It doesn't affect a lot of people, even though it disproportionately affect uh, these, and some of these disease indication, virus indication disproportionately affect us as a people. And so I get an opportunity to work with those companies to make an impact in my community. So it's just knowing that um, I think for me, it's innovation involved. Um, it's, it's an opportunity to make an impact on a global scale. It's an opportunity to allow longevity of life for our people in more ways than one, um, not just that patience, but being able to help close that wealth gap, provide high quality jobs, high wage jobs, giving them the opportunity to pass on something to the next generation of their family, whether it's closing the wealth gap and or providing an opportunity for them to do the fullest of their educational priorities for what they want to do in any industry. It doesn't have to be life science. It's all these things that are definite um, taken for granted and are considered uh, rights and staples of the Caucasian community that I can help transform to not be something as a privilege in the black and brown community, but it also become a staple and a requirement um, as far as expectations in our community as well. First question, no. Um, so we actually have a workforce development program that we're piloting here in Philadelphia where we're training members of underserved communities with at least a GED or high school diploma to be a bioprocess operator or a quality control technician in the lab. So no, we're only requiring um, a sixth grade level of education as far as uh, being able to read, write, and do math. And the reason for that is because um, everything is done according to what we call a standard operating procedure. So it's like a recipe. So uh, similar to if you're working at in and out and you have to follow instructions, how to construct a burger, how to cook the burger to a certain temperature, all that stuff. You do the same thing with manufacturing drugs on the floor. You're following instructions. You do everything in twos, never by yourself. Um, and you always use a calculator, um, even down to, even if they're using, uh, still using paper documentation, uh, we oftentimes have the um, boxes to indicate how many decimal places to go over. We have an instructions to say round this number, the number that you round up or down is that box is underlined. It's so many things um, that as long as you can read and write at a sixth grade level and have a, a high school uh, diploma or GD that you can do. So we, those programs um, are starting to come more out there, uh, but we're definitely exclusively doing that one out there. And then we have it twofold. So we got the entry level and then we have one for people that already work in industry that may want to level up. So if you're a manufacturing worker, you want to switch over to quality assurance or quality control. We got certificates through that through ISP, ASQ and uh, RAPS. So that's uh, International Society for Pharmaceutical Engineering. Uh, ASQ is American Society of Quality and Regulatory is Regulatory Affairs for Ooh, professional, regulatory affairs professional society, I think. I might have that wrong. Sorry, reps. Um, so no, the second part of it is, um, what was the second question you asked me? The second question is, if you were to go back to college now, what would you have pursued? What would you study? Uh, I wouldn't change anything. The only thing I would change in USC, University of Southern California, don't be pissed with me. Um, but if I had known about raps, then I would have got the certification and not went to school. And the reason why I say that is because when I came to USC, I already had industry experience. I already had experience working with FDA, Europe and Japan, uh, doing regulatory responses and drafting things. And I've, I've done all that respond to 43s. I've done, I had done all that at that time. So had I known about raps, I just would have got the certification that I could have got done in a couple of weeks versus the two year program that took $60,000 out of my pocket to get a master's degree and that was my second master's degree um so that's that's the only thing i would have did different is take advantage and i encourage you guys now you know not every industry re requires for you to be uh, a phd or a master's definitely would pay master's does help phd not necessarily you you'll spend that money and, and still not get a pay raise uh, especially in life sciences um but uh the certifications 
is what helped you get along further and it's the best kept secret so what you may not know um is that in industry oftentimes these certifications are paid for by big pharma but they only pay for director level up to get them now think about that the time you get to director level you should know this why why am i paying you even without a certification you should have that much experience you should know it, but there's a gap so they're paying for them to fill that gap versus us that may be you know at lower levels on what i like to call the shop floor for 20 to 30 years that already have that knowledge without a certification you just don't have a piece of paper to prove it or the title to prove it so that's that point it makes sense for you to go the certification route pay the the one-time fee of maybe five ten or you know figure out a way to get your company to pay for it too or save your tax money and pay for that so that you can level up and go to the job. If you can't level up where you at, then you do like I did where you notice my LinkedIn profile. I moved every round, every two and a half, three years on purpose because for some reason that's the only way they take us seriously is having qualifications at a certain level if we come from the outside. If we stay there too long, then they, for some reason, same like slavery, you only look at us where we started, not where we going. Yeah, so heavily working on, you know, trying to finish acquiring this land and, and starting construction. We just received a $2.5 million grant uh, from the state of Pennsylvania to help with construction, and engineering, and build out of our life science park um, in partnership with Urbane uh, here in Philadelphia. So that's big for us. Uh, we're in the middle of trying to complete a tech transfer for one of our customers. Um, that deal right now at the, for the first part of the deal, which includes tech transfer and the development, um, investigation and development of the actual uh, larger scale manufacturing process um, is worth about 125K. Um, and that's for proprietary cell therapy media. Uh, but they also have a drug that will hopefully get that contract as well. We're still working on that. And so the overall contract probably for the media, media product will probably be, uh, look, I say it won't be that much from my, my perspective. Uh, but I'll probably say I'll probably get up to maybe maybe a half a mil, maybe a little bit over half a mil for the proprietary media product. That's just for um, getting the process, develop, and manufacturing product for CGLP, uh, which is still research and development. When they move into CGMP, then we may inch up because that'll be on the regular cadence. And it'll be, excuse me, larger volumes um, at that point. So maybe we'll ink out a little over a million from, from just that product. Um, when it's all said and done, and then the drug product um, easily, you know, could be in the area of, uh, for preclinical studies, they'll probably be around 15 to 20 million. And if we continue on from them from clinical to the commercial market, uh, they'll probably be in a, uh, maybe an additional 42 to 50 million, probably a little bit higher than that um, because of the clinical trial piece and how much product you have to have to service phase one, phase two, phase, especially phase two, phase three, you need a lot more products. So um, that will probably be, I don't think it's going to be exactly at a hundred million, but it'll it'll be probably close to it for the drug product, and that's coming from the same customer. Um, and so then we're in the process of recruiting other customers. Um, we finally getting ready to sign a huge marketing uh, deal, some paperwork. I've been negotiating that deal for two years. Did y'all hear what I said? Two years. I've been negotiating with a lawyer back and forth to get this marketing deal, which is going to help us with our customer pipeline, rebuild our website. Um, and get our name and our and our technical capabilities out there a lot more with white papers and things of that nature, which is really huge in our industry. Um, and then outside of that, um, you know, I just came back from the White House back in September and speaking on the bioeconomy, biotechnology panel. So we're waiting to hear back. And so we got to start getting with the lobbyists to keep our ears to the ground so that when that contract comes out, uh, which is also financing to help uh, support um, build out of our facility, uh, we could be ready to take advantage um, of that contract. And then there's some other things we look in, into. Uh, I, I'll share a little bit of it, but you know, as we, as we, you know, we're in inflation, I'm pretty sure they're going to say we're in a recession first and second quarter. And so when you think of recession, you know, from these are the different mindsets and I'll go through it again. If I'm hourly work and I think a recession, I'm like, oh, I might get laid off, you know, maybe let me put in some extra time or go get a second job. If I'm in the salary level, it's like, ooh, let me make sure my actual role is relevant <laughs> so that I don't be included in these huge layoffs that you're starting to see with Twitter and Amazon and all those folks at the salary level. You're like, oh, let me make sure it's relevant. If it's not, let me volunteer, stay a little late, right? Because you don't get no extra pay, but it's just making yourself stand out, right? If I'm a small business owner, ooh, 
if we in a recession, what kind of product, what kind of service can I offer to help my community to purchase at a cheap price so I can maintain business if these other things don't sell? If I venture capital back like I am, hmm, how can I pivot to meet the market needs and what does that look like, right? And so for venture capital back, it's a lot bigger. Like, what am I going to do that's innovative, that meets the needs, that can give me the biggest bang for my buck if I was to attract a large account holder of whatever it is that I sell? And so let's just say healthcare is one of those things that has longevity, right? Whether it's recession, uh, depression, uh, we're good, whatever. People always need pandemic, non-pandemic, epidemic, Pandora. I don't know what call this thing now. Shit everywhere. But whether you have that, you know, healthcare is always in. And so as a as a biotech company, it's one of the things that you can look at. You can look at what you're good at. You can look at the expertise of your team. Um, what is financially appetizing to investors because we're a venture-backed company. So how can I attract additional investors? How can I attract, you know, additional money from the current investors I have or that I've been building relationships with that what is this thing that's going to trigger? And so one of the things that trigger in healthcare is how are we going to maintain healthcare costs? how people are going to hold on to their prescriptions for prescription they may have to take every day for the rest of their life, right? So let's just say Lupus Pop Bio is just highly interested in the biosimilar, uh, bio better market. And we just started those conversations yesterday. So we'll see what shakes out. Woo! I, for me, I think uh, what's most important in the next 20 years is really bringing down the cost of goods and services for manufacturing to help encourage um, companies such as big farmers and other ones to bring down these drug prices. Um, I just had a conversation right before I got on the phone with you um, uh, for, you know, talking about the cell therapy industry and great technology, you know, novel technology, obviously doing what it's do. You still got former president, Jimmy Carter standing there. I think, hell, he looked like he going in reverse. Last time I saw him wrinkles fading. And I don't know what kind of cell therapy he got. But uh, the reason why he is doing as good as he's doing or similar to Magic Johnson with what he has for his treatment for his HIV is because they have the money. They have the access to this technology um, to have them, you know, to 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 enable them to have longevity and be comfortable. And then they also have things to make them de-stressed in their life. Right. They have money. They can go to spas. They can take trips. They can. This is getting too much and go sit somewhere during a pandemic for two years in the sun, not doing shit, eating shrimp. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that uh, for bioengineers that we, we find a way to really uh, uh, bring in higher titers um, of these products and, and lower the cost of goods and the manufacturing costs so that the people that actually need this can have it, you know, and in black and brown community, when we get sick, it's just such a huge uh, detrimental you know, impact on the immediate family and the extended family from that, right? Because nine times out of 10, it's the key people that are working the hardest, that are the, the breadwinners of the family that get sick. And it's because they don't have the luxury. Like I told you about the hourly worker, you know, you may not have the luxury of taking um, time off when you want, you're going to get it, but you may not be able to, to use it when you want to use it because you're at the beck and call of that particular employer. And so we're able to bring down the cost of drugs to help people get back on their feet a lot quicker um, and do what they need to do or not impact how we so often see Black and brown families have kids in college or in graduate school that often have to drop out to come help and, and support the parent. Imagine if we had these drugs at a cheaper price with a parent or the person that's sick and get back on their feet fairly quickly and do what they need to do for their families. Um, that changes um, our, our wealth gap and our, our income generation uh, situation or even just being business owners. That takes out them too, right? And that small business track, you're, it's only you sometimes that's working, maybe one other employee. So as soon as you out, that's the that's the downfall of your business. So making these drugs more affordable, um, working more closely uh, with the the federal government, and being even at the engineer level, being transparent on the actual cost um, to make these drugs, to formulate these drugs, um, is what I hope to see in the next twenty years.